Prima Media's Engineering News and Mining Weekly is interviewing Donovan Chim Handamba, the CEO of Nianza Light Metals, which is taking steps to move South Africa's ilmenite mineral up the value chain by using it to produce titanium dioxide pigment in South Africa's KwaZulu-Natal province. How far is South Africa from locally beneficiating ilmenite into the significantly higher priced titanium dioxide pigment? So, so we get it very close as a country. Uh, I mean, considering we started to look at this about 18 years ago. Um, wh what has been the challenge is obviously the barriers of entry are capex. You'll see that uh, the price take to, to build a significant plant of this nature is quite steep. We've made uh, huge progress uh, over the last 18 years, particularly the last two years. We completed all the bankable feasibility studies. We also commissioned what we call a product testing development center, which basically helps us with uh, you know, producing samples that the customers really needed to be able to evaluate what kind of product we produce. So now the phase we're going into, which is construction of the main plant, uh, technically started in August uh, this year. Uh, we, we building that titanium plant, we've split it into two phases. We had to do a mini equity close where we had to find uh, sources of funding to start with the construction or the bulk earthworks. Uh, pr primarily looking at site leveling, doing um, uh, clearing, uh, doing the, geo the detailed geotext because we've got the loads now. Uh, and that uh, has been uh, what we started in August. That should run until August or Q2 next year and at that point the site will be deemed ready for, for, for the EPC contractor to now take and build the plant going upwards. If you look at our construction timeline we have technically started construction in August. Uh, it might look a little bit slow for now because it's all the bulk earthworks, it's all the site preparation works and we've worked well with uh, Richards Bay IDZ and the Department of Trade and Industry in, in putting this together and now what we're finalizing for the main plant construction to happen which is not on the critical path as we speak uh, is to work with Africa and Bank and Africa Finance Corporation as the core MLAs to, to put that together. And we think we, we probably another four or five months to completing that part. And let's talk about finance. Uh, how did you get the finance? How much was it? And is it going to be sufficient to take you through to the final product? The nature of the project that we're building, um, it requires long-term financing. So naturally, what you'd find in Africa, that comes from DFIs. So the bulk of our lending actually is coming from development finance institutions, both locally and from the continent. And, and that gives us 12-year tenor in terms of financing. Now, because of the, the tenor as well, obviously, the financing costs become quite steep. Now, if you look at uh, the project CAPEX itself, it's, it's about $550 million, uh, just the CAPEX alone. Um, but then when you bring in the financing cost, because construction period runs over 42 months, so 36 months to mechanical completion and another six months for commissioning and getting into a ramp up mode. So if you take th that period, naturally, again, private equity is sort of like not capable to take such long periods of, of no cash flows. Uh, the local commercial banks struggle with uh, beyond seven years tenor. Um, so, so we had to do some fancy structuring to, to be able to bring in the multilaterals and we've got some significant good players. Maybe now is not the appropriate time to mention them, but most people in the project uh, are very well aware of all these DFIs. And uh, if you look at the peak funding with the financing costs with the uh, working capital, it picks at close to $900 million. So 860 there to $900 million, which is quite a significant uh, price take. One thing that I want to highlight why the number is huge because industry standard people will be wondering why is, you know, is it so expensive for such capacity. Uh, there are a couple of things that have happened. One, if we're building this plant in the US or in, the, in Europe or in China, their industrial development zone come fully uh, equipped with, uh, with utilities and infrastructure. So in our case we had to build uh, a demon plant for example because there's not enough potable water within Richards Bay that if we were to, to pipe into the existing potable water systems, that will create a shortage within the Richards Bay city. So we have to bring in clarified water. We have to then demineralize it. That's a huge plant in itself. 
we had to do we had to also build our own sulfuric acid plant that's a huge plant in itself i mean that's a thousand tons per day capacity we had to also bring in um for our steam boilers because we deliberately because of our esg philosophy we deliberately moved away from anything with coal so you'll find that uh, we're firing our steam boilers with uh, gas so lpg to start with to hopefully uh, the the actions that are happening around LNG will materialize in time for us to switch to LNG and even reduce our carbon footprint. So when you take those utilities, the rail and all of these things over and above the actual titanium dioxide plant, we have almost have got almost three hundred million dollars in the ticket just to deal with utilities. So so things that would have normally been uh, operational expenses where we buy across the fence are things now that we had to bring in as capex and to avoid the risk of these things not being built on time. So we've put all of this under one package. And your tie up with the Chinese group that is doing the engineering and procurement and construction, uh, how is that going? So I think, I think that, signi that was a key inflection point in our project development. Initially we were looking west. We tried to find an EPC contractor, went through 17 companies globally. Uh, but the big issue was that outside China for the last 34 years plus, there has not been any greenfields plant, either the expansions or, or of some nature. But what then that means is that if there's no one who's been building these plants, there is no engineering uh, house that actually can do that. Whereas when we went to China, I mean, over the last 30 years, there have been 60 plants built in China. Uh, in those 60, 41 of them have been built by some engineering company, which is called East China Engineering Science and Technology. So they've built 41, they've operated quite a significant of them, and they always transfer them to, to the ultimate owner. So, so when they came on board, we, the, the whole feed, the whole detailed engineering design, w it just put everything to settle and fix and start, because now there was certainty around how the plant was going to be built. They could provide an EPC lump sum fixed and key price, which is very uh, critical for, 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 for lenders when you're doing a greenfields plant because no one wants to sit with, I mean, we speak about cost overruns and whether the funding is enough. So at least if you can, if you can settle the dust on the, on the cost to build the plant and you get a guarantee around that, you know, that helped us uh, move quite significantly. And having them as an EPC contractor, also having them as an O&M contractor, so they'll operate the plant for five years over and above, they're also put in there injecting equity into as an industrial sponsor. Their balance sheets, uh, in terms of size, um, they are a subsidiary of uh, world's number one uh, refinery and petrochemicals company called China National Chemical Engineering Corporation, which has a balance sheet of about $19 billion, and they turn over about $25 billion. When you look at Dangote refinery, uh, the, the refinery critical component EPC package was delivered by them. When you look at Sonango, the current expansions at Sonango happening, that's, that's them. And if you look at most of these fertilizer plants in North Africa, they've been delivered by them. So them as a subsidiary, they turn over, they have a balance sheet of $1 billion, turning over just around $1 billion as well. So they bring in that, um, uh, that, that financial stability and capability uh, that, you know, in these parts of the world, we hardly find such capacity. And what about the market that you're going into, you know, the titanium dioxide pigment pricing? How is that doing at the moment and what price will you need? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a commodity. Uh, we fully understand the cyclicality of, um, of the product itself, the product price. But uh, if you look at the feedstocks as well, the feedstocks that go into producing this product, which is largely ilmenite or sometimes titanium slags or rutile, they also 90, I think, above 85% or 90% of those mined ores are actually sold into titanium dioxide pigment manufacturing. Now what that means is that um, when you face this cyclicality, then you have a connection or you have a relation, correlation between the price and the feedstock. So, so generally they move together. There might be a small leg between the prices and the nature of the industry is such that uh, you know, when, when you, the industry goes, when it goes down and then it picks quite significantly or to, to extreme positions. For ourselves, now if you're in that uh, cyclical market, I think the most important thing is where do you sit on the cost curve? Uh, so we've been designing this uh, deliberately, thinking about how we, we want to protect ourselves from that cyclicality. 
And the, the most sure way of doing that is making sure we, could, we produce at the lowest cost. So we have taken advantage of that. We've built our organizational plant to almost mimic manufacturing cash cost of Chinese plants, which gives us a very low cost base, albeit slightly higher than the Chinese uh, production cost. But at the same time, we intend our target markets are the premier markets. So these are markets where Chinese is, is facing huge embargoes for anti dumping so if they want to go to the U.S., you get, uh, you know, anti dumping tariffs of up to 31 percent. South Africa is 10 percent. In Europe, they've just uh, slapped uh, China with a five-year 14 to 16 percent um, anti dumping uh, tariff. So, so if you look at the markets, Asia Pacific has the lowest price, and China, the Chinese dominate in Asia Pacific. We intend not to sell there. But if you start going to Europe, Africa, and America, and South America, the prices are, ex are extremely high. In fact. Europe is going, has been going through massive deindustrialization, and we think in the long term that's a, that, that, that market will see huge prices. Now, non-Chinese plants serving serve non-Chinese markets, I think that's a double whammy that we, we might have. A, it's a trend we've seen in other industries as well, and we think that's how we intend to compete. And what is so special about this uh, titanium dioxide pigment? I mean, where is it used? And yeah, yeah, so sometimes I forget to talk about this, but um, titanium dioxide pigment is, is one material you touch every day. So it's widely used, mostly used in making paints. So when you talk about paints, you've got what we call decorative paints or architectural paints, which you use to paint your house. Uh, then we also have automotive paints for your car. And then you have industrial coating. So when you're building a plant and you need to uh, you, you know, the, 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 the pipes, et cetera, need to be painted. You provide those industrial coatings. So that's one huge, large market. The next big market after that is plastics. So those two probably take about 70% of the applications in terms of uh, where pigment goes. Then after plastics, you also then have things like FMCG, where it's used in sunscreens, where it's used in toothpaste, where it's used in milk. We're not in that market. There's a process in terms of uh, qualifying your product to, to, to be able to serve in the FMCG kind of applications. You have other things like inks for your clothes. We can produce that. It's small volume, but it's also quite a lucrative market. Um, but our primary focus now is industrial coatings and paints. That's our primary, and plastics. Those, those are, that's where we would be producing most of our, our pigment. And that's, that's where uh, titanium dioxide pigment is widely used. And where will you get your ilmenite? Are you sure of getting it? And so, so we use what we call sulfate ilmenite. Uh, so the ilmenites are not uh, monolithic. So you've got different types depending on the quality or the amount of titanium dioxide pigment. So that's one. And secondly, what's also critical is the chrome content in some of these ilmenites. So you'll find on our KZN Coastal uh, bed, we, the, the ilmenites, they have slightly higher chrome percentage making it not lucrative for our kind of process because then the chrome has to be bleached out or you have to put in some processes to either roast it out or to, to take it out. But if you start going north, we've got Kenme. We have, uh, in Mozambique, there's also a, new, a mine owned by Chinese. You also have uh, base resources in Kenya, although that resource is depleting. In Egypt, you've got the Egyptian Black Sand Company. Um, and then locally here, we also have uh, a mine that a couple of mines that have approached us that are operating at a better than small scale, producing what we call the sulfate ilmenite concentrate. So these ones, they now produce, it's not from the beach sands, but it's from the titaniferous magnetite inland. And they run their own process to, to produce a concentrate, which is of high quality titanium as well. And we are busy exploring some, uh, some of these resources uh, because in the long term, we obviously would need to have some uh, backward integration strategy to just stabilize our feedstock supply. But our feedstock, which is sulfate ilmenite, is more readily available than what you'd find as a feedstock for the chloride type of pigment. So you've got two types of uh, pigments, one that's made using the sulfate process, using sulfuric acid, and one that's uh, made using uh, the chloride process, using chlorinate oil. And the two, uh, when you produce them, you'll find the chloride pigment suits more for automotive paints, whereas the sulfur pigment suits more for decorative paints, architectural paints, plastics, etc. And sulfur pigment currently probably is 55% of the global market. 
and 45 to 47 percent is the chloride pigment. Those are some of the dynamics, but I think the type of feedstocks, coming back to your question, is the feedstocks that we need, we have uh, a wider variety of feedstocks we can use. We're even exploring some uh, high volt steel slag, which we have used in the past, but because it's new technology, we might phase it in only as, at a later stage by bleeding it in, but we've run those trials, we've produced some pigment using it at a smaller scale, and um, we have many options. In South Africa, it's endowed with these slags, and and we think by us being here, it starts making these projects more viable. And, I, and we already seen some mines talking about opening their heavy mineral sands mines because there is an ilmenite a sink, which will be Nyanza. And why have you set the 80,000 ton a year as the project's capacity? What is special about 80,000 ton a year? So, so, so the rate determining steps is the calcina. Uh, so in, in our process, when we produce the pigment, we have to calcine the titanium. So we calcine it to dry it, but we also calcine it to impart some, uh, uh, some physical properties. Uh, and those calciners come in capacities of 20. These are cement kilns like. They come in, you can do 20, you can do 30, you can do 40, you can do 50. In China, they, uh, we've, we've seen 60,000 ton capacity. So we've opted for a 40 purely because it's well known, uh, it's a well known capacity. Uh, we won't have experience challenges in terms of uh, finding the people who can run it. The maintenance and sp uh, parts are, uh, you know, are readily available. So we decided to buy to put two inline calciners. So each one is 40. That gives us the 80. So that's 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 we could have gone bigger, but we we then you start introducing other dynamics in terms of spare parts, the experience in terms of running such such large calciners, etc., into into the equation. And uh, <coughs> what progress have you made to generate your own solar power that you were thinking of doing? Yeah, so so we've, uh, we've done a couple of studies on site. So initially our plan was to put solar on site. Uh, now we're in the Richards Bay Industrial Development Zone and the land is not uh, cheap. Uh, we always use the example that um, you know, putting solar plant inside the IDZ is like farming cabbages in Santon. It's, it's, uh, it's, uh, the, the numbers just don't add up. But what we have done, we have not removed uh, solar as part of our energy mix. We have signed a power purchase agreement across the fence. There are a couple of, a number of uh, entities already building. Uh, some will, will, some are looking at over the fence. Uh, so we know already of 10 megawatts which we have signed, which is being constructed as we speak. And we have uh, proposals where we have signed with people who are developing wind farms in Richards Bay but also other people who want to do s solar enveloping the Richards Bay IDZ. So it's agricultural land or slightly cheaper land, which the economics then might work out much better than on site. So we have solar, but added to that, in terms of our energy um, strategy, we also, and we developed Nyanza under very harsh conditions when ESCOM was going through its, so you can imagine the over design that people had to do in terms of bringing energy stability because a plant of this nature you can't allow it to, to idle. So you have to put in strategies like black stats, uh, uh, strategies in terms of what happens if there's total power failure. So you must safely shut down the plant. So you have to put up backup generators to deal with that. We also have a sulfuric acid plant in terms of um, making on, on sulfuric acid. That process is exothermic. We generate a lot of heat. Uh, that heat, we, we then generate uh, superheated steam and we put it through steam turbine generators and we have our own core gen plant. And that's eight megawatts. So in total, we, we at, at start to start up the plant, we, our peak demand would be around about 33.1 megawatts. We'd want it to be slightly lower by phasing or deciding how we start the plant slowly. But once operating, we use 18 megawatts. So if we need 18 megawatts, we already have eight megawatts from, from our own internal generation sources. Then we have our solar, uh, you still need to have ESCOM as, as part of your base load in some, some nature. So we have that. And over and above, I know the Richards by IDZ and the DTIC uh, are looking, are exploring issues of uh, putting batteries. So maybe 150 megawatt hour battery uh, as, as, a, as a service provision to the site. And that can then also boost all these renewables or solar coming in. And whenever you have uh, the total power failure, you can supply the zone, including us, with, um, with power for a period of, of time. 
but all of these initiatives were informed by the challenges that we were facing a few years ago and they are already designed into, into, the, into the operation. In the training of young people, you have been training, you had a product testing center and uh, how many will be employed on construction and uh, operation? So we're going to see from early next year, the number of people on site start to increase. And we have two parallel um, uh, labor, uh, let me call it employment activities happening. So we have a construction period. That construction is largely subcontractors under the EPC contractor. And over a period of 42 months, probably in year two, you'll see the number peak to 3,000 people on site. Um, and, and in that number, there's quite a large contingent of young engineers that will come in through the process. Uh, and that runs over a period of four years. So that's quite significant, especially in the, rich, in the, in the Richards Bay area. The second part of the line running at the same time is that we have to, because of our own operational readiness initiatives, we have to start building our own contingent. Now, this contingent will work under the, oper uh, the o and m Operations and Maintenance Contractor, uh, although they're employed under Nyanza's books. And this contingent must ramp up to 850. So it will start slow, and probably in year two, you'll start seeing a contingent come in, being taken to China, six months in China, in, in blocks maybe of 60 each, uh, and they become the nucleus of, of Nyanza. So they will go and work at an identical plant that there's a couple there in China which our partner has built. They will actually go there and work for, for a period of six months. They come back, they become the nucleus. And with our product testing and development center, we have capacitated ourselves with the ability to use this nucleus now to as the training platform for, for the rest of the organization as they come in. So, so in short, uh, we're looking to ramp up to 850. Uh, there will be a large contingent of youth. Uh, we're trying to work with CETAS, Department of Labor, to see how we can all collaborate to, to bring uh, capacity in terms of recruiting and funding this youth development. And we can guarantee some absorption of these people towards the end. But these are skills that can be used in other industries as well. Just give me a picture of the owners. Who owns all this? So, so we, so we started uh, Nyanza ourselves. So currently, the largest, uh, the large owners are still sitting with Akin Industrial Holdings, which is where most of us as management and founders uh, hail from. And we, it was principally funded by our fund management activities because we also had a private equity fund management uh, side where we obviously made some cash to to bankroll the feasibility studies. But over time, we've transitioned everyone to 100% into Nyanza. Um, but that's, so it's, it's largely the management that owns uh, Nyanza. And then we also have a company called DBF Capital Partners. They're the ex-owners of Banka ABC, which was sold to Atlas Mara. Um, uh, so that's on the equity ownership now. But that picture is about to change as we speak because now all these other investors are coming on board and we, we, as soon as we have the second phase uh, financial close, which is imminent, we, we, we will see some uh, DFIs, uh, development finance uh, institutions, some multilateral finance institutions from, from Africa and some from Saudi Arabia and some from you know, all the parts of the world and even the UK also all uh, become part of the equity structure. And there'll be, there'll be some significant dilution ourselves, but you know, dilution in the context of the size of the project is, is very understandable and normal. So, so it's only that I can't go through the list of them. I can disclose the uh, uh, what we call currently uh, the project core development partners, those who have been co-investing with us to complete the feasibility studies. So we obviously have the Africa Export Import Bank, Africa Bank. It came in in 2022. Uh, and then we have oh, 2021. Then we have Africa Finance Corporation, which came in 2022. Uh, and we have obviously been working with the Richards Bay IDZ and the Department of uh, Trade, Industry and Competition. And together we, we have continuously funded or provided or put structures and incentives to, to see this delivered. From the government perspective, this is, this is something that they have been pushing for for quite a number of years. And I think we're all aware of um, the mineral beneficiary and value ad addition uh, focus, but we, we think we are putting something that 
is tangible and that will probably stimulate other, other projects of this nature in the country. And when will that first titanium dioxide pigment come out of your plant? We expect uh, in 2027. 2027. We, we, we have some tool manufacturing that we're doing in the short term uh, just to, for us to be in the market and be able to, you know, the advantage of working with our Chinese partners is we can do that uh, because the raw materials uh, are exactly the same we're going to use. We, and we, we ahead of uh, construction completion, we're trying to make sure the industry has got an idea of what we'll be producing. Um, but also just learning the market as opposed to reading research reports is very crucial to, to us developing our sales and marketing strategy. So, so we, we're doing that. We're working with uh, the likes of Trexis. But our own product, we expect it in 2027. And titanium, by the way, is only the start. We only mention titanium because it's the anchor one, but they, they are follow-on byproducts that, are, that will follow through uh, yeah, subsequently. What are those follow-on byproducts? So, so lithium iron phosphate, zirconium oxychloride, and fumed silica. In our operation, when we make titanium dioxide pigment, we generate what is called copperous or iron sulfate. We generate quite a lot of it. It's got industry applications, a bit low value. You can use it in industrial effluent treatment, water treatment. You can use it uh, in other various uh, medicinal applications as well. But the volumes we produce are quite significant that they need a proper sink. Uh, when we talk about sink, they need a proper uh, uh, operation that absorb it and turn it into a high value product. In China, the plants that are built by uh, ECC or our partner, they all come, uh, they operate on a full circular economy uh, basis. They produce, uh, the iron sulfate is then taken to produce lithium iron phosphate. So you take the iron sulfate, you already have the sulfuric acid, you bring a phosphate rock, you produce uh, high purity phosphoric acid, you react with the iron sulfate, you have iron phosphate. And that's your first stage uh, battery material used in, in, as, as a cathode material in your, in your electric vehicles or batteries or storage system. But then once you have that, you react that with either lithium carbonate or lithium hydroxide or lithium oxide, just calcination. And that then gives you lithium iron phosphate, which is the dominant uh, 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 battery material, uh, for the, uh, according to all the reports, and if you look at the Teslas, the BYDs, most of their batteries are actually uh, for the vehicles are all built using lithium-ion phosphate. So it's not necessarily following this energy just transition trend that's happening. It is actually out of necessity in the sense that we produce byproducts that you can easily turn into this, and we've ring fenced this phase we are in into focused on titanium with the production of the iron sulfate. But quickly we have to uh, start developing, and we already started those feasibilities outside, ring fence outside the Nyanza operation, and at the right time, we'll find ways of integrating them. But we, we and we call ourselves internally, we are uh, uh, specialty chemicals and energy transition company, because once you have lithium iron phosphate, that's your energy transition materials, zirconium oxychloride, uh, also used in titanium pigment for coating, but it's f easily it's starting to grow in the battery energy materials as well, where it's used in solid state batteries. Your uh, fumed silica, which is in a shortage in China, fumed silica is uh, you're largely used as the adhesives. And when you look at all these battery components, all, when you put them together, you want a material that's able to give the electrical properties that are required. So, 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 so we, we think once we have the titanium, the real story will just balloon uh, as we now roll out uh, the following investments to complete the circuit of uh, what our industrial complex will do. And finally, Donovan, what should be the big takeaway from this? I think, uh, first of all, 13 years has been quite uh, uh, remarkable in the sense that it's been a test of character. And what we have learned is we, you know, there's a lot of patience, there's a lot of focus, there's a lot of adaptability. Uh, and if you are to develop such industrial projects or pioneer such, like how the Sasso's and the ISCO refractories were, were brought into market or into life, it takes, it takes quite a lot. And I think the government, uh, multilaterals and DFIs need to take heart in that it's possible. 
but it comes with a significant uh, price of patience and, and cost. So, I mean, up to the date, we are over $30 million just in feasibility studies. And, you know, that's a, that's a couple of business in its own right, <laughs> you know, fully funded. So, so, so I think perseverance, dedication, focus, strategic thinking, and adapting to market conditions is, is what we've learned. That was Krima Media's Engineering News and Mining Weekly speaking to Donovan Chimhandamba, the CEO of Nianza Light Metals which is taking steps to move South Africa's ilmenite mineral up the value curve.